Greetings, and welcome to the CCOS Foundation Certified Organic Pot, Find Out Why Not webinar. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have three great presenters who will review frequently asked questions regarding why cannabis can't be certified under the USDA National Organic Program, give an update on California cannabis regulations, as well as provide information on ways you can support sustainable cannabis policies. Before we begin, I wanted to give a warm thank you to our sponsor, Kind People. The Kind People's reputation for operating one of the state's most professional and successful retail genetics departments has come from a commitment to support local farms and novice growers alike in regenerative best practices. Kind People strives to bridge the gap between cannabis and community while inspiring all to achieve optimal health. If you're having difficulties connecting to the webinar, can't hear, can't see, please call our office for support at 831-423-2263. Press zero for the operator and someone will help you connect to the webinar. My name is Megan Donovan and I will be your host today. I'm a program specialist at the CCOS Foundation the CCOS Foundation advances organic agriculture for a healthy world through education and hardship grants, technical assistance, and consumer education. We are very excited to have a great lineup of speakers today. From CCOS, we have April Crittenden, Director of Farm Certification, and Kelly Damewood, Director of Policy and Government Affairs. We're also very pleased to have Amber Morris, Branch Chief of Cal Cannabis Cultivation Licensing at the California Department of Food and Agriculture, also here with us this afternoon. I'll introduce each speaker in more depth prior to their presentation. Before we get started with our first speaker, I wanted to review a few items. As you're aware, cannabis is unique. At the federal level, cannabis and cannabis products remain classified as illegal Schedule I drugs. April will touch on this more during her presentation, including how as an organic certifier accredited by the USDA National Organic Program, which is answerable to federal law, CCOS cannot certify products that are not federally legal. At the state level, cannabis regulations vary regionally. It's always good to know your regional cannabis regulations. This webinar will highlight California's cannabis regulations for those of you attending the webinar from outside of California, your state's regulations regarding cannabis may differ. On a similar note, CCOS is just one of many organic certifiers. In the United States, there are actually over 50 certifiers authorized to certify farms and businesses to the USDA organic regulations. For the organic farmers and processors in the audience, it's always good to check in with your certifier regarding their policies and procedures. April and Kelly will be presenting this afternoon on CCOS perspective on cannabis, but they can't speak to how other certifiers are approaching cannabis. So, you know, as you know, in general, it's always good to check in with your organic certifier before making any changes to your organic systems plan. I also wanted to let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on the screen in the control panel on the right. Within the control panel is how you can participate in today's event. So let's take a look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close the control panel. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel not to auto hide when inactive if you prefer to keep it always open. The audio pane provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar via mic and speakers. If you prefer, you can join audio via telephone by selecting phone call and the dial in information will be displayed. During the presentation, you can send questions to our webinar staff through the questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. After each speaker, we will we'll stop for questions from the audience and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. As a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view a recording of today's event along with a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. 
So we'd like to encourage you to test out the questions pane. Um, write in and let us know what sector you work for. I think we have kind of a mixed crowd out there today. And also how familiar you are with organic. And also just to note, we have a good group of people in the audience today, which is great. Um, and we're going to try to respond to as many questions and comments as possible. But we wanted to apologize in advance if we don't get to your specific question and encourage you to follow up after the webinar with additional questions and we'll provide you with contact information. So thanks again for being here with us today. Without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to introduce April Crittenden. April brings a wealth of knowledge on the National Organic Program and Environmental Stewardship in Farming Systems to her role as CCOF's Director of Farm Certification. April has worked at CCOF for over 10 years. She began her career with CCOF as a farm certification specialist, where she gained an understanding of the organic regulations for both growers and livestock producers. As a quali quality and compliance supervisor, April was responsible for overseeing all complaints, investigations, and CCOF's pesticide residue and GMO sampling programs. In 2016, April worked with SC Labs to develop and implement the EnviroCan certification program, which offers certification services to cannabis producers. Prior to her years devoted to organic certification, April studied at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she completed a double major in environmental studies and anthropology. So April, thank you for being here today and letting us know some of CCOS answers to the common questions we get on cannabis. Thank you, it's a pleasure. So CCOF has seen an increase in inquiries regarding organic certification of cannabis over the last year. So I've compiled the questions we're asked the most in order to provide you with an overview of our policy and why we can't currently certify cannabis to the National Organic Program regulations. As we're all aware, many states across the nation have legalized cannabis for medical and or recreational use. This slide provides a visual representation of just how many states have moved in the direction of legalization. The bright green represents recreational, and the darker green represents states where medical use has been legalized. The main issue for us as an accredited certification agency that verifies compliance to the National Organic Program is that cannabis is still classified as a Schedule I drug by the federal government. As an organization that envisions a world where organic is the norm, we would like to see cannabis production and processing meet the organic standards. The historic black market nature of cannabis production has resulted in significant environmental, human health, and land use issues. However, the state versus federal allowance of cannabis production creates a major conflict for all accredited certification agencies. The National Organic Program is a program under the USDA, and since cannabis and cannabis products remain classified as illegal drugs at the federal level, we cannot certify them until they are recognized as an agricultural commodity. Furthermore, the federal government has recently indicated an intent to aggressively enforce these laws in states that allow recreational use. So we're often asked, can I include cannabis as a crop in my organic system plan? The short answer is yes. We get calls almost weekly from our clients wanting to know if they can add, add, add cannabis to their organic system plan. Many of our farmers have expressed a desire to use cannabis and hemp as part of their crop rotation for intercropping and even as an option to increase biodiversity and add diversification to their operations. We strongly believe an organic market and certification system for cannabis would increase incentives and provide ways to highlight the efforts of conscientious growers. We are currently allowing clients to include cannabis in their organic system plans so long as all practices employed and materials used are compliant with the National Organic Program. Our inspectors verify this during annual inspections, including verifying invoices, planting and harvest documents, 
as well as input application records. Inspectors will also verify that there are no organic claims made on crops and products produced with the cannabis grown. So we will allow producers to include cannabis in their OSP, but the crop will not be listed on the client profile and no organic claims can be made. Will I lose my organic certification if I grow cannabis on certified ground? Not if you're using organic compliant practices and materials. The NOP regulations require that land be free from prohibited material applications for three years prior to the harvest of an organic crop. Therefore, if any unknown materials are used in the production of cannabis on certified land, then the certification of that ground is at risk and may be suspended from the program. If the material is used is found to be prohibited, then the land would have to go through a three-year transition in order to be eligible for organic certification in the future. The use of an organic claim on labels, retail signage, or even websites may result in enforcement, which could warrant a proposed adverse action, such as suspension or revocation of an operation certification, and possibly again, even against the accredited certifier. This level of enforcement may have even greater consequences beyond certification if the Drug Enforcement Agency is made aware. It is due to these risks that CCOF cannot certify cannabis. Can I grow hemp? Can it be certified organic? Yes. If produced in accordance with the 2014 Farm Bill, in August of last year, the NOP released Instruction Document 2040 regarding organic certification of industrial hemp production. This replaced the previous instruction that was issued in February of 2016. This instruction clarifies the requirements certifiers must follow when certifying industrial hemp. The 2014 Farm Bill authorizes institutions of higher education and state departments of agriculture to establish industrial hemp research or pilot programs. Of course, this is only in states where production of industrial hemp is legal. Additionally, the USDA worked with the US Drug Enforcement Agency and the US Food and Drug Administration to publish a statement of principles on industrial hemp. This document provides further clarification on how federal law applies to activities associated with industrial hemp that is grown in accordance with the Farm Bill. Hemp as defined in the Farm Bill must not contain more than 0.3% THC, which is the psychoactive element most commonly associated with cannabis. So what this means is certifiers can certify hemp to be organic standards if it is being produced as research under an agricultural pilot program by an institute of higher learning or under a state agricultural pilot program for research on the growth, cultivation, or marketing of industrial hemp. Can CCOS certify cannabis edibles or CBD? No, not at this time. CBD is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid found in cannabis and hemp. It can be used for many ailments and has gained a lot of attention for its effectiveness in treating seizures in children. Unfortunately, it was classified as a Schedule I drug in December of last year. This means, similar to THC, that certifiers cannot currently certify CBDs or products containing CBDs to the National Organic Program. This also applies to edibles containing THC or CBDs. Can I use organic approved pest control materials? Now this question does not directly affect certification, but I think it's really important for organic producers to know. The EPA has not reviewed any materials for use on cannabis. This means that there are materials that are allowed for use in organic production that are not allowed for use in cannabis production. The two big ones to be aware of are spinosad and pyrethrin. You should not assume if it is OMRI listed that you can use it on cannabis. Please be aware of these limitations if you're producing cannabis. There are some states that are setting allowances for pesticides. 
So always check with your local and state regulators to ensure your use of materials is allowed prior to using them. Are there other types of certification for cannabis? There are several organizations that offer certifications for cannabis and hemp. Most of them use the National Organic Program regulations as the structure for their certification program. Legalization has brought to light the rampant use of pesticides in cannabis. EnviroCan, one of these organizations, recognized this issue and built a more rigorous testing component into its certification program, along with an increased focus on natural resources and waste management. EnviroCan tests for pesticides at every stage of production to verify that prohibited materials are not used. Certified Pines, based in Oregon, has also developed a certification program that is based on the National Organic Program. These certifications provide cannabis producers the opportunity to market their products as higher quality or clean products that are grown using sustainable methods. As I mentioned before, they're not allowed to use the word organic, so they have current coined terms such as Enviroganic, Certified Kind, and Clean Green to convey to consumers that their certified products are produced using organic methods without using the word organic. Being rooted in the USDA organic regulations, these programs prepare producers to comply if and when the federal government recognizes cannabis as an agricultural commodity. So that's the majority of the commonly asked questions. Uh, thank you for your time and I can open it up to anyone in the audience that has any questions regarding certification of cannabis. So thank you, April, um, for that good overview of a lot of the questions that we get coming in. Um, so if you have questions for April, please type them in um, and we can answer them here online. I also wanted to just loop around to our beginning questions and it looks like we have a nice mixed crowd out there. We have some people that are part of an organic producer network um, we have some people in cannabis retail as well as um, that work in laboratories, some organic inspectors, and some people from a county ag department. Um, so we had a question come in asking um, for CCOS clients that grow cannabis, will the cannabis be listed as a crop on the work order even though it will not be on their profile? On the work order, are you asking whether the inspectors are aware that cannabis will be a commodity that they need to audit at the inspection? Yes, absolutely. Um, but it will not be a commodity that appears on your client's profile. Okay. Great. So I think if you have any other questions, um, write them in. And if not, we'll We'll loop around at the end of the webinar for questions for everybody. So if additional questions for um, April come up, feel free to write them in at any time. But we'll move on to our next um, speaker. Actually, we do have one more question. Um, are you aware of any uh, research that's being done in California on um, hemp production that CCS growers could be a part of? I am not, but I would welcome any information that anyone out there has on that. We have not seen um, much momentum in California in terms of hemp production, but I anticipate that we will soon. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and then we did have one more question come in saying, what type of enforcement can be taken against producers who do label uh, products as organic? Um, I'm assuming that means uh, cannabis products. Yeah, that was something that I touched on um, previously. Um, because it is not a commodity that can be labeled as organic, it could result in a proposed adverse action, um, either suspension or revocation, depending on the use of the word and, and how it came to be. So using the term organic to market cannabis would put your organic certification at risk. Great, thank you. Um, 
So we're going to move on to our next speaker, but if you have any other questions for April, uh, feel free to type them in at any time. Um, and same with the other speakers. If something comes up during their presentation, feel free to just go ahead and type it in at any time. So thanks again, April, and we'll loop back around with you at the end of the webinar. So now I'd like to introduce Amber Morris the branch chief of the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Cannabis Cultivation Licensing Branch. Amber oversees implementation of the cultivation licensing program for medical cannabis and adult use cannabis. She has worked for the California Department of Food and Agriculture for nearly a dozen years in several capacities, most recently as the environmental program manager for the Interior Pest Exclusion Program where she directed statewide implementation of the Phytophthora ramarone program, agricultural detector dog team program, phytosanitary export program, and the county high-risk pest exclusion program. Prior to her service with the state, Amber worked for the Sonoma County and the Sacramento County Agricultural Commissioner's Office. She has a bachelor's degree in environmental studies and planning with an emphasis in conservation and restoration from Sonoma State University. So Amber, welcome. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon and I'll pass the presentation over to you. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, thank you CCOF for inviting me to present today. Um, I'm with, again, the Department of Food and Agriculture. In the cannabis world, there's lots of state agencies that are involved. So I just want to make it clear from the very beginning that the Department of Food and Agriculture is responsible for cannabis cultivation. So anyone who's growing the plants for flower. Um, hemp is also, I'll mention this at the forefront, um, under the Department of Food and Agriculture. However, it's not under the same division. So any questions about hemp are, um, they're to be directed to the Department of Food and Agriculture, um, but it's not my forte. So I'll do my best if you guys have any questions about hemp, but uh, we're responsible for the flowering product. So I'm going to briefly go over a couple of topics. Who does what? Because there's so many players in California. I'm going to go over the laws and regulations because they are a, a moving target. I'll let you know where we are now. Um, I'm also going to go over where we are in the program environmental impact report we're doing for the statewide program. And then I'll also touch on two technology projects that are underway. So who does what? So as far as licensing the cannabis industry, there are three agencies in California that are responsible for licensing. For cultivation, food and ag is the lucky winner. Uh, for manufacturing, that's the Department of Public Health. So manufacturing is anything where it takes the raw flour and it turns it into something other than the raw flour. So we're looking at all of the extracts that are produced, all of the products that are made with the extracts, so any of the cookies or the tinctures or the lotions or all of those manufactured products. To do any of that manufacturing, you would need to be licensed by the Department of Public Health. And then the third agency involved is the Department of Consumer Affairs. And under them is the Bureau of Cannabis Control. This agency has the responsibility for licensing the distributors, and that includes transporters. Uh, testing labs, and the dispensaries, so the retail. So there's three agencies issuing five different types of licenses. For Department of Food and Agriculture, in the law, we are responsible for issuing licenses based on the type of cultivation you're doing and the size of cultivation. So you'll see at the top of the slide, there's the type, the uh, outdoor indoor mix light. And then on the left side, there's the specialty cottage, specialty small, medium, large, and nurseries. So these are the different sizes that the department will issue size licenses. Um, I do have a note under medium. So all of the outdoor indoor mix light for medium, the law requires the Department of Food and Agriculture to limit the medium licenses issued at the state level. Um, we have proposed that that limit be one per person. Um, that's just an, a proposed rigs, so that is not um, a final regulation. Large nurseries, in the law, it actually requires that 
the large nurseries, and if you notice here, there is no limit on the size. It's just ones that begin at an acre or at 22,000 square feet and are just larger than those sizes. Those, um, based on law, will not be issued by the department until 2023. And I think that the intent of holding off on issuing those large license types is to allow our legacy growers or those small growers within the state to get a foothold in the market before we open the door to larger companies that would have larger grows. Uh, and then lastly, we also will be licensing nurseries. Uh, nurseries are people who are growing plants, but not for flower. They're actually growing the clones or the propagative material that other nurseries, I'm sorry, that other cultivation sites may use or they would also be growing the clones where you could buy at a retail location. So um, with the passage of Prop 64 or the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, it does allow anybody who's over the age of 21 to grow cannabis at home. And so we expect that we'll see a lot of nursery producers selling clones for uh, people to actually grow at home. So I mentioned three agencies that are involved with licensing. Keep that in mind. Three will be licensing the industry, but I think every single one of California's departments are involved in creating the regulatory uh, framework. So CDFA in particular is working with uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulations, the State Water Resources Control Board, and the, 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 the Department of Fish and Wildlife very closely. So as part of our licensing requirements, you will need to comply with all three of those agencies regulations for water, pesticide use, and our um, critters, we like to call them at Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we will also be working very closely with the Department of Justice. Any applicant that comes to the state for a cultivation license will be required to have a background check uh, through fingerprinting in the Department of Justice. Uh, labor, so anyone who is operating a cultivation site under our licensing will be subject to every other law that applies to any other business in California, including Cal OSHA. Um, we're also partnering very closely with the locals, so cities and counties can create ordinances that um, the law was written in a way that allows local control. So locals have the ability to ban cultivation in their city or their county. Um, they can also be more restrictive than the state. So locals, um, the, again, the law was written in a way where locals have control over what happens in their communities. And as part of our application process, we work very closely with the locals to verify that the applicant applying to the state is in compliance with local ordinances. We're also working very closely with the Department of Technology. The Department of Technology is overseeing our uh, work on track and trace, and also we are putting up a licensing system, which I will go over a little bit more in detail later. Um, Treasury, obviously cash is a major issue that the state is grappling with and um, the Treasurer's Office is working very closely with us as a good partner. The former Board of Equalization, I'm sorry, I need to update this slide. They are now the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. So CDTFA, formerly the Board of Equalization, they'll be collecting the cultivation tax and the excise tax at sales. Uh, the board of the medical board, patients, caregivers, all three of those because of the medicinal use, and the governor's office. Everything that we're doing is under close oversight of the governor's office. They are looking forward to seeing this succeed and they're just helping make sure that we are on track to make that happen. So in California, there were previously two sets of laws that governed cannabis. One was issued in 2015, it was the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. That was passed by the legislature and only addressed medical cannabis. So it was the first attempt at creating laws that would regulate medical cannabis. And it was very detailed. Um, shortly thereafter, so within a year, the voters also passed Prop 64, or what's known as the Adult Use of Marijuana Act. Um, we were told very loudly and frequently by states that had gone before us with um, putting in a regulatory structure for cannabis that it is not a good idea to move forward with two sets of different regulations for medical and adult use. 
Um, reason being is that when someone is growing a plant for either medicine or adult use, and there's two different sets of regulations that would confuse not only the industry, but also the agencies that are regulating the industry. Um, it's also, it was also perceived as a potential inefficient use of state resources to have two different sets of laws governing the same thing. Um, and so what happened is the governor's office realized that it would be good to look at the differences and work on aligning the two sets of laws and just in June of this year, June of 2017, um, a bill was signed, it's Senate Bill 94, which basically repealed the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. So that act and the laws that it created are no longer there, they're repealed. And um, it updated the Adult Use of Marijuana Act to be streamlined with uh, the medical use and to include medicinal and adult use. Uh, another thing that it did specifically, and that's why we are talking today, is it uh, mandated the Department of Food and Agriculture to establish a cannabis program that is comparable to the National Organic Program. So if you would like to read that law, the, the law is uh, Business and Professions Code 26062. And it describes that the department is mandated to create this program. It gives us a little bit of time to do that. Um, it gives us until January of two, uh, sorry, 2021. Um, and then it also addresses if the federal barriers come down and it is someday uh, acceptable between states, so um, federally, that this section would no longer be operable and the, the National Organic Program could step in. So it has the foresight to at least give California some time to develop how we're going to approach this. And then it addresses what will happen if the uh, federal government changes their uh, stance on cannabis. So with laws, it basically allows state agencies to create regulations. So in creating regulations, all we're doing is further clarifying what the law is. Um, providing the industry, hopefully I, we did our best to make it plain language, um, but giving them a good set of, of clear guidance on how they will become licensed as cultivators. So with the, I'm gonna back up a slide. So with the Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act, the department started moving forward on the regulations for medical cannabis. We, published those regulations and their draft regulations. We go through the um, Standard Administrative Procedures Act process to adopt regulations. So we issued these draft regulations in April with a 45 day comment period for the public. We received a bunch of very valuable comments from our stakeholders, um, not just the industry, local government, um, the public. We had really good feedback and when regulating a market that's never been regulated before, it was very important for us to get valuable input because since we've never done this before, it, it hasn't happened, we wanted to make sure that we weren't creating something that didn't work on the ground. So we did receive a lot of feedback on our medical regulations. However, because the medical law that allowed us to create those regulations was repealed, we have um, submitted our papers to withdraw the regulations. So moving forward, um, because we no longer have that um, package out there. We still have the language on our website if you want to see what we drafted. Um, and the reason why is because we're in the process now of creating a rulemaking package that will move forward to address both adult use and medical cannabis cultivation. So we withdrew the medical regulations. We received lots of feedback we are going to be able to use a lot of the language that we put out in the draft medical just because they're um, when they combined the two laws they did retain a submit there was a lot of crossover where things didn't change so we went through our medical regulations and determined what could stay and what had to go based on the new law the combined act uh, we reviewed all the comments that we received and we are in the finishing stages of creating the language for the combined regulations. Because these 
regulations have to go into effect on January 1st of 2018. It's a legislative mandate. We don't have enough time to go through the Administrative Procedures Act, so regular rulemaking for this combined package. So what's going to happen with our combined package is that they will be issued as emergency regulations. We anticipate those emergency regulations going out in November to the public. Um, and after emergency rulemaking, so emergency rules are only in effect for 180 days. They can be um, extended for another 180 days. So within a year, we actually have to get our regular rulemaking in place. So after you see the emergency regulations go out in November, we will follow shortly with regular rulemaking, which allows public participation and a public comment period. So we look forward to working with the stakeholders in that process. For emergency regulations though, uh, although the public does have the opportunity to comment, it's a very sh shortened time frame, and um, the emergency regulations will be posted regardless of the comment. So just so that everybody's clear on that, that's, that's kind of our intention with regulations for cultivation. Um, also the other two licensing authorities, the Bureau under Consumer Affairs and um, Public Health, they are on board with the same kind of timeline for releasing their emergency regulations. So the regulations we're gonna cover, this is just uh, kind of a boiled down what we cover in our regulations. They're going to cover definitions that weren't defined in law. Um, for instance, we have to issue cultivation licenses based on canopy square footage, but canopy wasn't defined. So we're gonna be adding um, key terms that are used in our regulations so that the regulations are consistently applied. Um, application, there's an application section. It's gonna detail for our cultivators how you apply, what's necessary, uh, the detailed information of what the department needs to receive to consider the application. Licensing will cover limits like we talked about on medium licenses. Uh, it will also cover general licensing requirements, how often you need to renew. Um, then there's site-specific requirements. We are including environmental protection measures. Um, we're also detailing the records and uh, the requirements for track and trace that cultivators will need to keep and how. Um, cultivators haven't had a lot of experience keeping tight records. In fact, they, they haven't done that for good reason. They haven't kept records around, so this is going to be new to them. So we've tried to be as explicit as possible in the regulations. We also have a section on inspections, uh, what the cultivators should expect as far as inspections. And this is basically an opportunity for the department to verify compliance. Um, with all the requirements that are out there, we just want to make sure that we're giving an opportunity to this newly regulated um, industry, an opportunity for them to be compliant um, before we take any enforcement action. So enforcement is, of course, our last step. But if we find that we've licensed someone who cannot or will not comply with the requirements of being a licensed cultivator, we have a section that details out um, the process for repealing, suspending, or revoking a license, their um, ability to uh, appeal that suspension or re revocation or um, action on the license. So we do detail out for the cultivators in this section what um, violations are serious versus moderate and the uh, fee that's associated with them. Again, we would really like to gain compliance before taking uh, enforcement action, but it is there so that it's a transparent process so that people know that if they cannot or will not be compliant, that there are financial implications with that. So I have this in here um, just to be clear because this changed in SB 94 and it's a little bit unclear um, for a local permit. So previously in the medical law, it did require that we first, that anyone who came to us had to have a local permit. So their, their local agency had to be permissive and they had to provide evidence of that to CDFA. Uh, the, the new law under Business and Professions Code section 26055 um, requires that we contact the local agency. So instead of requiring us to see a permit from the local agency, we may or may not be provided a permit, but there's a whole process that's dialed in in Business and Professions Code 26055. 
where we engage the local agencies to ensure that what we're doing at the state level is not in contradiction to what they've established at the local level. So it's changed a little bit. The program environmental impact report. So we began the uh, program environmental impact report last April. So we've been in this for about a year and a half. And when we first started, it was only for medical. Uh, we expanded the scope recently, so this April, to um, include also adult use. So we had to reissue our notice of preparation in, I, I believe we issued that in April this year. Yes, sent out in April. Um, so our program, our program environmental impact report now covers both medical and adult use. And here's kind of a timeline. So um, in June, we put out our draft program environmental impact report for public comment. We're not here anymore, I apologize. Well, we actually are here. So we, re we are through our public comment period and we are in the process of finalizing our document. Um, something to consider is that we cannot go out with our emergency regulations until we have our environmental documents certified. So we are expecting to certify that in November and then right after that uh, go out with our emergency regulations. So in our environmental document, we're doing it on a program level. So we are evaluating the entire state and in, in doing the CEQA process, a California Environmental Quality Act process, there are certain areas of cannabis cultivation that we cannot address in our document. So I'll give a couple example of, it, of examples. One is because we don't know where we will be licensing people specifically, um, we can't evaluate whether or not they're in an endangered species territory habitat. So things like that, we are actually going to require, so there's holes in our program document. Another one is um, traffic because we don't know who we are or where we're going to be licensing, we can't address traffic. But So there's these holes in our document and when a cultivator applies to CDFA, they will have to provide documentation that they're meeting those holes, either through a local CEQA documentation or if their locals haven't conducted CEQA that covers those site-specific um, analysis analyses, um, then the cultivator will actually be part of the process and um, CDFA will become the lead agency to certify those holes. So it gets a little complicated, but um, we do have this environmental document that we plan to get out in November. Local agencies will be able to tier to it, um, but it does not cover CEQA 100% just because of those site-specific analysis we couldn't do on a statewide level. So lastly, um, we are putting together, we're standing up two technology projects right now. One is our licensing system. So we are in the year 2017 and we are excited that we're gonna be able to accept applications online. Um, let me go back there. So we anticipate having our licensing system go live shortly before January 2018. Um, and when I say shortly, I mean <laughs> not very many days before January 2018. Um, we're, we're doing our best to get it up as quickly as possible, but the timeline we're operating under is pretty tight to begin with. So you should see us announce um, our licensing system sometime in December. And then track and trace. So the department is the lucky winner for being responsible for standing up the statewide track and trace system. So what that means is that uh, CDFA is standing up a technology that will allow all licensing authorities, so the three different departments operating in this space. It's a, a system that all three of us will use for our licensees to make sure that we are able to track cannabis from the farm to the retail site. So there's a couple of reasons for that. The track and trace system is being developed to ensure that product that is grown illegally doesn't enter the regulated market. We're also um, making sure that product that's grown in the legal market doesn't end up in the black market. I mean, there might be some price differences between the two, so we would hate to see someone who's operating in the regulated market divert their product outside of it. And then also, if there is a, a legitimate health concern, 
um, from someone who has purchased a product that was grown in the regulated market, the system will allow us to track it back um, to either the manufacturer or the farm or the, the distributor where it became contaminated. So um, the state has one system we'll be using for all licensees. It does not um, prohibit, the law does not prohibit a, a local agency from having their own track and trace but I am trying to be as transparent as possible that if there is a track and trace at the local level, it may require the cultivator to enter their information into both. There's an opportunity that we have. Um, there, there's an opportunity for interfacing with those systems, um, and we hope to have that up and running as quickly as possible, but those local agencies that have a track and trace system, it is in addition to the state, so it does not supersede the state. So here's our contact information, uh, calcannabis.cdfa.ca.gov. Here's our phone number. We actually answer the phone. It doesn't go to a message. You can talk to someone if you have questions. And then if you have any questions about cannabis, uh, if you have questions about hemp, we're happy to forward your uh, questions on to the appropriate CDFA program. Um, but we do check this email on a frequent basis and we respond to it. So if you guys need any additional information or if it just blew your mind with all the things I threw at you, um, you're welcome to call us, email us, or visit our website. Great. Thank you for that overview of the California cannabis regulations and kind of how they're moving and where they're going. Um, and so we wanted to open it up to questions for Amber. Um, feel free to write them in. We did have a couple come in while you were giving your talk. And um, someone was interested in learning more about starting a nursery and wanted to know where they could find more information on um, how to start a nursery. So the best resources resource that you have right now is available on our website. Um, and it's the medical, the draft medical regulation. So we do touch on what the requirements of an application are, um, specific for nurseries, um, how you can have mature plants so that you can get seed production, how to do research and development. All of that's addressed in our draft regulations that have been withdrawn. So although it may be changing, again, we're recycling a lot of the information. So that's a good place to go to kind of see the direction the department was headed for nurseries. Great, thank you. Um, and then someone also wrote in wanting to know where they can obtain a copy of the November emergency regulations once they're out. So we have on our website, there's actually a, a place where you can sign up to get automatic emails. I would encourage everyone on the phone who's interested, we don't spam you. Uh, we just let you know when we have anything important to announce. The, the last email that we blasted to our, our uh, email list was about the withdrawal of our regulations and kind of the process moving forward. So when the regulations come out in November, we will definitely make sure that the people who have signed up for automatic emails get that email as soon as the regulations are available. So that's probably the most efficient way to get it. Great, thanks. Um, and then we also had someone who is wondering who would be good agencies at the local level to contact just to find out more about your local regulations. So it's it's um, in the law, the local regulations and the promulgation of ordinances were not assigned to one local agency. Um, we partner with the Agricultural Commissioner's Office, um, and I know that they're involved in some local agencies, the planning department is also sometimes involved. So I would suggest starting with those two and you know, if it's not them, I'm sure they can point you in the right direction. Great, thank you. Um, and then we also had a question um, wondering how clone testing is gonna be addressed. Uh, so interesting in SB 94, nursery stock was written out of testing requirements. So clones going directly to retail will not be tested. Okay, thanks. And I um, and I can follow up and give you that uh, business and professions code. It's in there somewhere. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Um, and we're also wondering, will pesticide tolerance be established under the CDFA regs or um, public health regs? So that's a very good question. Um, 
So the word tolerance is a federal term, so similar to organic. Um, the California Department of Pesticide Regulations does not um, set the tolerance levels for pesticides. That's the federal government's job. So what the Department of Pesticide Regulations is doing instead is defining uh, residue limits. <laughs> so um, that is under the purview of the Department of Pesticide Regulations, and they are working hand in hand with the Bureau to provide them those residue limits. Um, and those will be part of the testing requirements. Great, um, thank you. And I think we're gonna wrap up the questions for Amber right now, but if anything else comes up during the presentation, we'll open questions back up again. So Amber, thank you again for your presentation and um, filling us in on what's to come with cannabis in California. Thanks for having me. So next, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly Damelin. Kelly is living her dream job advocating on behalf of organic farmers as the Director of Policy and Government Affairs for CCOS. After a brief stint running a small organic farm, Kelly went to law school determined to help farmers navigate the legal issues that impact their ability to grow food in a better way. She received her JD from Vermont Law School and her LLM in Agricultural and Food Law from the University of Arkansas School of Law. Kelly is also influenced by her diverse experiences living and working in different regions of the United States, including growing up in Texas, selling products at outdoor markets throughout the Pacific Northwest, and writing for an online newspaper with worldwide distribution. Most of all, as a member of the millennial generation, Kelly is committed to carrying organic advocacy well into the future because she believes organic truly is the movement to transform our food system. So Kelly, thank you for being here and I'll pass it on to you. Okay, thanks Megan. So thanks for the opportunity to speak and, and address uh, some updates from CCF's policy department. So many of you know CCF is an organic certifier, and of course, um, our foundation hosts these webinars. But we also um, have an arm that operates as a farmer-driven advocacy organization. And so it's my role at CCF to work on behalf of CCF-certified farmers, ranchers, uh, handlers, to advocate for policies that support organic um, producers. So, our work on cannabis regulation and certification so far. So we've been watching with a very keen eye the development of these regulations. Um, organic was once the new and evolving sector of California's agricultural economy, and so it's quite fascinating to watch um, cannabis evolve as well. And it really takes the growers, um, coming together with government to create the standards and to create the processes that work to make the system one, run well. And so we've been trying to be as engaged as possible um, given the wide range of, of issues that we work on. And we know we have a lot of members who are interested in incorporating cannabis, who may already have cannabis um, production going on in their, their farms. So first and foremost, we've just been monitoring, monitoring developments and trying to inform our members as best as possible. I just want to echo Amber's encouragement to sign up for Cal Cannabis Updates. They have a great web page with a lot of information and send out relevant emails at the right time. That's how um, we actually stay up to date on what's going on with Cal Cannabis. So far, we've tried to weigh in where possible as these regulations have been developed um, to advocate for streamlined regulations. It is so important, given California's complex regulatory environment, that where possible, we streamline regulations, especially to make sure that the small to mid-scale producers um, are able to incorporate cannabis into their production if they need to or want to. We've also been encouraging the California Department of Food and Agriculture to learn from organic stakeholders' expertise and experiences. Like I said before, organic also has the experience 
of um, stepping into a robust regulatory environment and has developed a, you know, a successful model of working with um, state and federal government, accrediting private and public institutions to do certification, and a very transparent democratic process for developing organic standards. So we've really been encouraging um, the state to, to learn from its robust organic sector as it develops cannabis standards. And then finally, from the outset, CCOF has been supportive of CDFA creating a program that mirrors the national organic program. Um, we believe in a world where organic is the norm and we want to see the organic standards apply to cannabis as well. So those are some of CCUF's priorities, um, our priorities so far. Keep in mind there's a wide range of certifiers and advocacy organizations. So these are just some of our priorities. Um, not trying to make the case for any specific one, just hoping to give you guys some more information. So moving forward, we will be especially interested in the development of uh, regulations for SB 94, um, in particular the mandate for the California Department of Food and Agriculture to create a certification program that is comparable to the National Organic Program and um, California also has a state level requirements that the program must align with as well. So we um, will be participating in any stakeholder working groups that may be available and keeping a close eye on those developments. As CDFA moves forward to develop a program, um, again, it's 2021 is the deadline, we have a couple priorities outlined. First and foremost, streamline requirements for organic producers. You know, last year, CCUF spent a, a, put forth a great effort to streamline our state organic requirements. Um, even reducing the amount of paperwork it takes to comply with the state program can make an incredible difference in the day-to-day -day operations of producers. So we're really going to be looking for any way to streamline cannabis certification with um, existing or organic certification practices. Second, you know, we feel at this point that the department should accredit organic certifiers like CCOF or QAI or Oregon Tilt or any of the certifiers operating in the state to administer um, the certification program when it's developed for two reasons. I think first, we've seen that as a successful model, the most cost-effective way for the uh, a state government body to make sure that the wide range of the inspections and paperwork can be handled in the most cost effective way for for the for the those paying the fees and the um, taxpayer dollars but second also streamlining any inspection and paperwork review as much as possible for existing organic growers so if you have organic certification through CCUF for the rest of your crops, if you can combine and, and move your state cannabis certification um, and, and that bundle, like if we can bundle them together, then um, we see that as being a benefit for, for our members. And then lastly, the Cal we feel the California State Organic Products Advisory Committee should consider at least consider overseeing um, the new forthcoming certification program. This is an advisory committee that advises um, the Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture on our state organic program. So for any listeners outside of California, California is actually the only state that operates a state level enforcement program. It's an enforcement arm of the National Organic Program. 
And this committee oversees how much residue testing they perform, how they interact with certifiers, um, advises them on how many you know, miscellaneous inspections to do or even special projects like special GMO testing. So we really feel that if there is a cannabis certification program that is intended to be comparable to the National Organic Program, that this committee should certainly have some kind of oversight and advisement um, role in, in the future of that program. And so, you know, we're, you know, in communication with the members of the committee and asking them, you know, to consider whether this is an option for their committee um, and whether that would be worthwhile for them to pursue. So again, these are just CCUF's goals at this point going forward, um, and I'm sure there's a wide range of other stakeholder viewpoints from other organizations as it develops. So to stay engaged with us as we work on this ish these issues, you can always sign up for CCS e-news at our website, ccuf.org. Again, strongly encourage, if you're interested, signing up for the Cal Cannabis notices. For policy-specific issues, if you're wondering about the California Organic Products Advisory Committee meetings or how you can weigh in on developing regulations or how you may want CCUF to weigh in, always contact us at policy at ccuf.org and encourage you to attend public meetings when available and keep in mind that in addition to CCUF there's also there also may be local cannabis grower groups or associations um, and that can be another good way to get engaged in advocating for what you um, may want to see in the forthcoming certification program. All right. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, that's a great overview of CCO's work thus far on cannabis policy and also ways people can get involved moving forward. Um, so thank you. And we wanted to open the questions up. Um, if you have questions specific for Kelly, feel free to write them in or any others for all speakers. We'll um, have a little time for um, questions and answer for all speakers. Um, so we did have a question for Amber um, that came in, um, wondering, given that there are limits on the lower, uh, the larger grower licenses, um, how what will be the selection process for these? So large license types will not be issued until 2023. Um, but medium licenses are limited to one per person. So there's not a finite number. It's actually just based on not giving one person an unlimited amount. So person is defined in the law as person, business, entity, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's really intended to prevent uh, one business from having a whole bunch of medium-sized licenses to, to stick with the intent of the legislation and allow an opportunity for the smaller growers to get a foothold. Okay, great, thanks. That's good to hear. Um, and then Kelly, we had a question come in um, asking, can those working in industry attend um, policy meetings at CCOF? That's a great question. So CCOF is actually made up of, of, of regional and uh, production chapters. Um, so if you, I, we can send out more information about our chapter system going forward, but we basically have um, regional chapters throughout the state of California, and we also have a more general processor handler chapter, and moving forward, we're working to create chapters um, for CCF members outside of the state of California. Um, these are just historical chapters that we've had, you know, for decades. And the way those chapters work is they meet about once a year and they elect a representative to the CQF Board of Directors. And so sort of the best way to stay engaged um, is to contact your chapter leadership, your, or your representative on the Board of Directors, 
or reach out to policy at ccuf.org. Um, sometimes we hold focus groups, sometimes we do stakeholder calls, um, task force, or sometimes we just do one-on-one -on -one communication with our members. So those are a variety of ways that um, you could be in touch on with the policy work we're doing. Great, thanks. And we had a similar question that came in that I think you already touched on. So that those working in the organic produce industry um, could also attend those meetings um, to be active in um, policy. Great. Um, and then we had a, another kind of broader picture question. So if any of the speakers um, have an idea of how this might be, but um, what information do you have on how cannabis will influence California agricultural markets, kind of, you know, the other um, industries out there. Does anybody have any information or can speak to that? Um, uh, this is Amber, and as part of our rulemaking process for the medical regulations, um, we are required to do an economic analysis. And also, as part of the CEQA document, we have to look at how it's going to impact agriculture. So in both of those documents, uh, sorry, in the in the draft program EIR that's available on our website right now, it does touch on um, how our project will impact agriculture. And another resource is as part of our rulemaking, we did have to do an economic analysis and our economic analysis is very robust about how it will impact all of California and includes agriculture. Um, that is available also on our website under documents and downloads at the bottom. It's called the Standardized Regulatory Impact Assessment. And we are actually updating that document for our rulemaking package that combines adult use and medical, but it's a fantastic resource if anyone wants to see the economic impacts of our program. Great, thanks. Um, and yeah, that sounds like that would be interesting and in that um, you have a lot of really good information on your website. So we encourage everybody to go check that out. Um, so I think we had another question just came in. Um, will the number of medium grower license be issued be limited? Um, and I think you may have covered that already, but if you could just clarify that again, Amber. Yeah, we just covered that. So it's one per person. Okay, yeah. Great. Person as defined by business and professions code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, specific meaning. Um, and um, so in the entire state, will there be a limited number? So will you cap it at like 50,000 um, licenses or it's just one person? No, the law only allowed us to limit medium. Okay. Um, and no, there's not like a magical number that we have um, of licenses that we will issue. So it's, it's as long as you can meet our requirements. Obviously, there's going to be some, you know, market competition. I think that that we will figure out how much Californians need and how much is being produced, and, and that will kind of work itself out. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think. We're going to wrap it up today, um, but thank you for all of our speakers for being here and um, filling us in on a lot of the great work being done on cannabis regulations and policy and sustainable cannabis. So thanks again to everyone. Um, also wanted just to touch on some additional resources. I know there's been a lot of good resources um, included in the presenters' presentations, but just to add to that, the CCF website has a lot of good resources and a lot of the questions covered in April's presentation are also on a blog post that we put out, so you can take a look at that and use it as a reference. Um, if you're new to organic certification and the organic world and just want more information on the USDA National Organic Program, um, the their website on the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service is a great place to check that out. And they also have, if you're you know, wondering what other organic certifiers out there or want to know what they're doing on cannabis and want to contact them about that, they have a whole list of um, organic certifiers you can check out. 
Check out our events page for upcoming events. This fall we will be running a webinar in Spanish on labeling and post-harvest handling for growers in Mexico, as well as a webinar on the new federal food safety regulations geared towards organic agricultural professionals. And then at the end of November, we'll have our annual San Francisco Wholesale Produce Market Tour. So if you're a produce grower and are looking to meet with buyers who specialize in organic in the San Francisco market, that's a great event to take part in. So thank you very much for attending today. We hope you found the information useful and please fill out your evaluation form. It helps us get new ideas for new events as well as improve our offerings. So we, we encourage you to fill it out and give us your feedback. So thanks again and have a lovely afternoon.